Hi, we're so delighted that you've joined us. We are the three priests of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Justin Crisp. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. Peter Walsh. And welcome to our podcast. As though our lesson last week wasn't enough, right? Being salted with fire and gouging out your eyes. This week we have a doozy of a gospel. Jesus is teaching about divorce and a saying about kids, which I have a sneaky suspicion is only going to sound nice. Marriage might be what brings us together, to quote the Princess Bride, but what happens when Prince Charming and Cinderella, uh, let's say, are on the rocks? Yikes. I miss gentle Jesus, meek and mild. I don't know about you. So let's hear the scriptures. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. So strong language here from Jesus on divorce. What do you what do you two make of it? Well, this this also um, this passage also occurs in Matthew, as we know. And yeah. the first thing that comes to my mind when I read this, even in Mark, is that Jesus' parents almost got divorced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. <laughs> God and had to intervene there, right? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, and, and it says clearly in Matthew right. that Joseph, you know, was planning to gently or quietly mm-hmm. divorce her and, and let her go. And so I have to wonder if Jesus ever knew about that story or if it's really true or, or, or something like that. But I also don't want to divorce, so to speak, Jesus, the Jesus we know from him, his response to this question. Yeah. And um, I, I think it's... You know, he's being asked about this. I have to wonder if he would actually take it upon himself to address it if he hadn't been asked and pressed. Because yeah. I don't think that divorce or even marriage is heavily on Jesus' mind at any other time. Yeah. And so I feel like he's being asked something. In a way, it's the minutia of the Mosaic law that they're pressing him on because the Pharisees have a division in their community and they're trying to see if Jesus will side with one or the other. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't think Jesus was all that concerned about, about the law. He, you know, he takes them right back to the beginning of God's intention. Um, so I, I want to just pull back a little bit on the, um, the fierceness of it in light of our culture and, you know, at least half the people listening um are going to be stung by this gospel totally for whatever reason but um so i don't know those are a jumble of beginning thoughts that i've had and i will talk more maybe during, <laughs> during the show maybe <laughs> after, we, <laughs> <laughs> after we see what uh, peter after, says after the commercial break yeah, from, exactly. uh, Ford Motor Car. <laughs> i you know i think that one of the i mean there's a lot of things that are incredibly interesting about this one of which is that the the question is sort of like the gotcha politics of today. Can they, mm. can they, That's you know, uh, get him yeah. to be one-sided or another? I loved reading about this and finding out that uh, Falls of 
Hillel, or you know, That's one right. on one side of the yeah. conversation here, the easier side versus the harder side. Uh, and the, but Jesus doesn't answer the question, right? So he he answers the question with a question, mm -hmm. and then he ups the game and talks about marriage and doesn't really talk about divorce until mm -hmm. the end. You know, sort of moves it in that direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is like Matthew again, where he makes the law harder. Mm -hmm. And, and uh -huh. then, he, then, he, then he drops like the boom, he drops in adultery, mm -hmm. uh, which was not even a part of the conversation. He ups the game on adultery. Adultery is one of the commandments. I think it's, I mean, there's two Ten Commandments in the, uh, in the scriptures, and I think mm -hmm. it's number six, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I, you know, what, something that we had talked about earlier, I think the amazing thing about this, the radical and revolutionary thing about this might not be all about that. It might be that he puts women, mm -hmm. he, he lifts up women here mm -hmm. and puts them on the same level uh, because before that only men could write a certificate of divorce and in a certificate of divorce, it had the sentence something like, uh, you can remarry in mm -hmm. the sentence. That, and that was, that was your passport to a new marriage. And now he's he's up to this to a point where um, mm -hmm. the disciples are befuddled. That's why it says they go in the house. Remember, they got yeah. they're mm -hmm. looking for some clarification from the boss here. Yeah, totally. I mean, I I, I think you're you're both really onto something. I I don't think that historically the words are actually as fierce as they sound to us today when we try to apply them to our lives in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly because of these um these opposing rabbinic schools that you both refer to. So uh, you know you mentioned Hillel and Hillel famously. So uh, basically, there were two major schools in the first century, right? Uh, there was uh, Shammai and Hillel, and Shammai was like the strict constructionist, <laughs> right, uh, of the of the day. And Shammai was very uh, did not want to liberalize the law, did not want to extrapolate from it, and so he thought that you know the only permissible reason for a man to divorce his wife, and it's always man divorcing a wife, as Peter said, uh, is if there's adultery involved, a serious transgression. That is adultery. Hillel was uh, more willing to play fast and loose with the law, and so he said that a man could divorce his wife practically for any reason, including an annoyance. The famous example is if um, the wife burns the evening meal, uh, the man can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the man yeah. can divorce her, which puts women in an incredibly precarious economic position, right? Mm -hmm. uh, given the household uh, economics of the day, right. and so what, the the most important line for me here is actually. Not what he says about divorce, not that we ought not to take his words seriously at all times, but the most important line that I want to take seriously is that if she divorces her husband, right. as you said, that's really the revolution here. That's what's not in Deuteronomy. That's what neither the schools of Hillel or Shammai were saying, is that Jesus says all of a sudden, he just sneaks it in right through the back door. Well, actually, a woman can divorce her husband too, potentially, at least you know, at least on the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. He really seems to have women's uh, women's uh, safety and perseverance and flourishing in mind here, perhaps because he knows this has been exploited by men in the past. Maybe, yeah, maybe so. Maybe Mark is trying to address the wider audience that might be touched by Roman culture already at this point. But, um, but, yeah, but yeah, and it's important, I think, that Jesus picks up on that. To, maybe he's saying the state has it. They're more advanced than the, than the Jewish law. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but yeah, I think he's always he's always on the side of the oppressed, and um, so I, you know, he's he's he. They already know the law, so it's not like he's um, enlightening them to anything. But uh, I I want to also go back at some point to what is why does he take them back to the beginning of creation? Yeah. God made them male and female. Yeah. This for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, I mean, laying aside all of our same-sex marriage questions and all that stuff that maybe also brings another controversy into this text, yeah. uh, there's something about the nature of human need in, in relationship that I think Jesus is pointing to them, pointing them to, you know, have a, marry someone that you can flourish with. You know, and I think that, you know, one of the problems is people want to get divorced because they're unhappy. They've and in this culture, I mean, this is so anachronistic to even talk about modern marriage mm -hmm. with this text. But I mean, we know now that people get married for all sorts of reasons and um, they get divorced maybe for the same reasons that they got married. It was a mismatch and all the wrong priorities or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um 
so, you know, Jesus, I think, is just directing them to the bigger picture of a nature of the relationship, that when you're in a relationship, um, you grow together, you know, as if you are part of each other's mm. lives. And, you know, I don't, I think that it's, it wasn't, it's not meant to be a mercenary, property-driven right. position, power-grabbing um, strategy to get married. But humans made it into that, mm. all the way up to empires and monarchs. Yeah, totally. Uh, Peter, what do you think marriage is? Is it established by God in creation? That's that, what well, the prayer book says. Uh, that's, I know. Right, so I it's a great question. Is. But I just yeah. remember, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Mother Ann Richards, uh, a blessed memory now, a uh, former associate here with Deary My Premarital Counseling, uh, which she did, she straight up said, I don't think it was established by God in creation. I think the prayer book's wrong. So there you go. There's an opening. Uh, do you want to disagree with the prayer book here? Disagree with the Lord, uh, but agree with Ann Richards. Uh, <laughs> what are you, a Pharisee? <laughs> <laughs> this is a question he cannot well, answer and win. With the, and win. With the, think, with the communion oh. of saints where our belief is that those who have died are present, I've got Anne suddenly in the room with me here, <laughs> uh, uh, a towering intelligence that she was. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the questions around uh, established by God in creation, as it says in the, uh, in the, in the prologue of our wedding liturgies, uh, and what it says uh, here in the scriptures and how that gets lived out in time, institutionalized through theology of churches, actually has a gigantic impact on the lives of so many people. Yeah. And that we do well to step back uh, and take a look at that in, 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 mm -hmm. uh, in the muddiness of all of our, our lives. I have no yeah. doubt that we are all outrageously clay-footed. The pursuit of holiness in our lives um, is is something that we can put on the horizon and walk toward. But uh, uh, arrival is, 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 I haven't met too many people who've arrived uh, in that way. <laughs> and, and the way people understand their marriages, the way they, they feel that their religion demands of their marriage, what Jesus demands of their marriage, I think can be problematic. Mm -hmm. We all know from the pastoral relationships that we have with people that there are marriages that are healthy and good and there are some that are terrible. Uh, and, and some people stay bound in marriages over time that are really destructive for them. Mm -hmm. yep. And so how do we apply the, the word here? Something that, uh, Justin, I know you've heard me talk about is the, the, the power of paradigms, religious paradigms that come toward us. Having grown up a Roman Catholic, uh, where I was taught that you, no one would ever be divorced. This was, mm -hmm. this was uh, verboten. And, uh, and then as I watch, as I grew up and I watched my Roman Catholic friends get divorced, I, uh, and then did this question of an annulment and, and became most quizzical to me. And, and so uh, some of the things that we've talked about is mm -hmm. that it depends on your picture of God. And so for the Roman Catholics, uh, Thomas Aquinas being the primary theological perspective that they have about, about the life of the divine, yeah. uh, and they have arrived at a place where they understand that God chooses your partner. Yeah. And, and therefore, if God chooses your partner and your marriage breaks down, there's only two options. One is that you have fallen into deep sin because yeah. you've screwed up what God has chosen. And, uh, and therefore, in the tradition, if you are divorced, you cannot receive communion. Or you married the wrong person, and it was null and void. It was a contract that didn't exist, and this was the an annulment idea, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we have that from one perspective. But in, in our world, our Episcopal Anglican world, we have a different perspective based primarily on Augustine, who says that we are wired to love. We're, we're born to love. That's to be made in the image of God is to love, because God, mm -hmm. the divine, is love. Uh, but we live in a fallen world, so 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 all hell breaks loose, right? What happened when they when they when they got booted out of the Garden of Eden, right? That's that's the story, and so therefore, uh, marriages that begin in love can break down, can fall apart. Mm -hmm. But people can be remarried in our tradition, in great part because we're wired to love, and we can fall in love again. Mm -hmm. And and so I do yeah. believe these words have 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 power, but they get power institutionalized over time, and depends on how yeah. we interpret them. And I, but I do think, you know, people who sit in our offices are affected by this mm -hmm. with, um, with, you know, you're, you're totally right. Shackled by it. Uh, you're, you're totally right. Um, you know, uh, a lot of that theologically in the tradition goes back to how to interpret the passage in, um, uh, it's, I think it's the fifth chapter of Ephesians, um, traditionally ascribed to St. Paul, but scholars don't know if it was Paul or not exactly. They're undecided. But I'll just say, you know, St. Paul there refers back to um, this passage from Genesis, uh, mm -hmm. right. you know, the suggestion that God established marriage in creation. And he says, um, 
uh, he calls it a mystery. Uh, you know, I, I tell you a mystery, the two shall become one flesh. And he suggests in chapter 5 of Ephesians that this is mystery, this mysterion, or the, um, the Latin in the Vulgate, the Latin Bible used in the medieval period, mm-hmm. uh, and also the patristic period, um, written by St. Jerome, or translated by St. Jerome, calls it a sacramentum. And this is what makes marriage a sacrament. Mm-hmm. Uh, is ah, it's a sign cool. of the love between Christ and the church. That's how it comes back from Ephesians. The, the Roman Catholics think that that sign, that sacramentum, binds the, for Roman Catholics, a man and a woman, period, from the very beginning, from the moment that they, uh, that they make their vows and perhaps also consummate their marriage. There are some debates there, but it's there all the time. And so divorce is not so much impermissible, it's impossible. It's impossible for a Roman Catholic to get divorced because the, the spiritual sacramentum is there forever. And I tend to think that's not the right way to think about it. I do think that marriage is a sacrament. I do think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. It shows us, uh, it is a, to quote the prayer book, it is a um, uh, it is a sign of the love for Christ and for uh, of Christ for His Church, something like that. But that this is something which takes place over the long haul of a life. It begins at the vows, but it doesn't actually end until the two are parted by death, as the vows also say. It's till death do we part. And not every couple makes it all the way. Not I. And and that is a, that's just a that's a um, that's a realistic fact of life in. The, this kind of human life in this kind of world, if we have the Augustinian view of human nature that we're wired to love, but we also find it very difficult to do. And so that rather than clobber folks with the fact, well, it was one and done, right? Instead, what we should say is uh, uh, how sorry we are that the aspiration that everybody has when they make the vows didn't happen to come true in their life in this particular case. Every divorce, I think, is is tragic in that sense. But many times, at least people sitting in my offices, I think that they're getting divorced is the most holy decision they could possibly make under the circumstances. Um, it reminds me of um, something I read recently by a, a priest in the church in Wales, um, an Anglican priest named Peter Sedgwick. And he said that Anglican moral theology is pastoral rather than juridical. It's not about determining right decisions in the administration of the sacrament of penance, nor is it primarily about obedience to the word of God. Instead, it presupposes a community in which moral theology will be exercised, a priest or a pastor who will lead that community, and an awareness that living together in community throws up difficult and searching questions. So if people are unsatisfied with the fact that we seem to be saying multiple things all of the time and that we don't have one clear yes or no, it's because that's actually, Anglicans think that's a good idea. You have to bring it down to the individual cases of who's, who are you talking about? Which marriages are you talking about? It's very dangerous, actually, to have a kind of blanket rule, yes or no, notwithstanding mm-hmm. the fact Jesus seems to give one. But mm-hmm. Well, bearing in mind Jesus also wasn't married and didn't face the challenges of a marriage. And <laughs> <laughs> totally. And that speaks to a lot of people, including one at this table. And, um, <laughs> I, you know, I think that God has made us for love. I, you know, I say that a lot at weddings, and we probably all say that. And, um, I, and so I feel like, Marriage is, is a context, just like the church is a context for a place to live out the hard knocks of mm. love mm-hmm. and growing in love. Beautiful. You know, growing in ways to accept people in all their frailty and own your own mistakes and forgive one another and reconcile with each other, help each other along, keep each other accountable. I mean, there are a lot of contexts for this kind of relationship and marriage is one Mm -hmm. and you know church is one and I think we fail in any context when um, we aren't willing to do the work of reconciling or I'm not saying that you fail if your marriage fails I mean there are many as you've said both said there are good and wise reasons to get divorced um sometimes in order to survive and live Absolutely. and thrive. And there's nothing wrong with that, I don't think. I don't believe that at all. But I think that if you enter into something, it's with eyes wide open that this is where I'm going to you know, mm-hmm. exercise mm. my, my calling as a human being to be in, a relation, be in relationship with other people yeah. and bring out their best and be my best self mm-hmm. and help each other out of the ditches we dig ourselves into. Oh, I totally... I mean, I, I have to say, notwithstanding the fact we've talked so much about divorce, marriage is awesome. 
<laughs> right? And I'm also, I'm thrilled that the Episcopal Church now permits any two people of any gender identity to be married, to, to try to love one another as Christ loves the church, right? Because mm-hmm. I experience the love of God in Jewel's love for me, even when I am a jerk. Uh, you know, I often, Jewel is often the hands of God for me, whether she's like, I've had some back issues this week, whether she's like massaging my back, or, you know, uh, whether she's picking me up after a difficult day. Um, I experience God's grace in my marriage in a really beautiful way. Um, uh, but we have to talk about the other people in this uh, in this ancient Greco-Roman <laughs> household, right? The kids. Mm-hmm. What do you make? Uh, I mean, this sounds like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, right? We've seen this particular, uh, I mean, you were talking about uh, airbrush Jesus and depictions of Jesus. You see Jesus with like the little children on his lap all the time. What do you guys actually mm-hmm. think is going on? Mm-hmm. Peter? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have five children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and each kid takes away 25% of your brain. Uh, so uh, there we go. You're running a deficit. Uh, yeah, I'm running a deficit for many, many years. 19. Phineas is 19. So just a few things about this passage here. I, I, I don't, as you know, I'm not, I'm not much on Jesus as meek and mild. I don't, I don't find him to be meek and mild. Uh, and in fact, I don't find him to be meek and mild here at all mm. uh, because it says the disciples spoke sternly to them. That's the same word as rebuke. So mm. they rebuke. And we, here we go back to the rebuke <laughs> off again. Mm. Who uses the word rebuke? We get it every, every other week here mm-hmm. in our podcast. Yeah. And then we find out that Jesus is indignant. Oh, he's like, wham! I mean, he's bringing the heat. So this is not Jesus meek and mild here at all. Mm. Uh, and sure. uh, and so I think he's he's pissed, and uh, to use a colloquial term for this, <laughs> and and what we find here is once again, Jesus is what I called a, a cast or two ago the God of reversal here. Right, last yeah. shall be first, the first shall be last. Yeah. Lose your life, gain your life, and now he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And it's like boom, kids, uh, mm-hmm. little children here. So I mean, he's he's turning everything everything upside down one more time. And so I think this is a very difficult guy to follow. Mm-hmm. He is really, really at every, at every turn throwing people's paradigms of thought, the mm-hmm. way they think, and just saying, nope, mm-hmm. turn it around, turn mm-hmm. it over, kick it out. Yeah, I think the disciples felt right in you know, shunning the children because they didn't belong in that setting where there was a teacher, you know, a wise man teaching the grown-ups. And I think they felt justified because that was mm. their culture, that children were sort of non-persons. And um, I'm sort of of the mind that that interpretation in the, the last gospel we had with children where Jesus says, um, unless you um, ex- receive the kingdom of God as a child, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's as you would accept a child mm. rather than, as, you know, accept the kingdom of God the way a child would. I think it's the way you should accept oh, a child. Yeah. So here I feel the same. It's sort of playing out that way too, that unless you accept the non-persons, the faceless, nameless, voiceless, mm. helpless, dependent creatures of our world, if you can't see them and welcome them and bless them and include them, mm-hmm. you can't see the kingdom of God. And so I think that that's, again, what he's doing here. And maybe that has some tie. I mean, we do read them a little bit separately here, but maybe it has some connection to the, the language, the conversation about marriage, because, yeah. um, you know, you can't, I guess, the, the, back to the women's position, they were very much the second-class citizen in the marriage, and, um, you know, they were, they were expendable. Like, I think men could much more easily divorce their wives and send them packing. And that he, as you said in the beginning, he, he, Jesus was concerned about their welfare. And, you know, unless you can see the woman, see the woman's point of view, yeah. give her the power to, to, to have agency, um, then also you can't see the kingdom of God. So yeah. I don't know. That would be a stretch, I think, for the listeners and even for us readers. But we're taking the time to make the stretch. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, to so. take just one more stretch, I think the two of you are totally right about uh, about the great reversal, about taking the view of the non-person. 
um, theologically, I, whenever I read this passage, I always think of our first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Thomas Cramer, who wrote mm. the first English vernacular prayer books. And Cramer was in the middle of a debate among other Protestant reformers about whether or not children should be baptized. Mm, right. <laughs> and so right. I, I came right. from a tradition, a Baptist tradition, which is called Baptist because we do adult baptism, like John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Uh, only adults could be baptized. Mm. Only adults who could make a confession of faith for themselves. Um, so no baptizing infants. And Cramer thought that was a bad idea. And he used, he, he was a very eclectic, uh, very eclectic liturgist, right? We think that these uh, old 16th century liturgies are, you know, very staid and proper. At the time, they were revolutionary. Uh, and he, the revolutionary change he made in the baptism liturgy is he appointed this lesson every time as a kind of like shot over the bow mm -hmm. to the reformers who were on the continent or agitating in England saying, Nat, we all ought to only baptize adults. Nope. Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. Mm -hmm. Little shade throwing theologically, which yeah, I think yeah. is very clever. A very Anglican virtue, shade throwing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our time, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, either one of you with a last word for our people. Yeah, I got a last word today. Um, I think that the the most uh, important word in all that we just read is actually the word receive. Mm. It's not about children and it's not about divorce. Uh, it's not about marriage. I think the, the whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, I, I think that the, 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 the most uh, intense word for the life of our spirits is that uh, we cannot achieve the kingdom of God. We must receive the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And that to receive the kingdom of God takes a tremendous humility, uh, and it takes a tremendous putting down of the paradigms that we're all so sure of. But uh, I, think it's about, I think it's about receiving a, uh, a, a divine love that has no boundaries. Has no boundaries. Amen to that. Amen. That's a good last word. Absolutely. Please uh, like, share, and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Help us to share more of God's grace with a world in great need. God bless you and see you next week. Peace. Peace.